Hey everybody, it's Mr. Jarvis. This is the introductory PowerPoint to Unit 4, which focuses on the 1820s and the 1830s. Now, this unit focuses in particular on one person, and that's Andrew Jackson. And that's really because he kind of changed the way that politics in the United States work. But before we get to Andrew Jackson, we're going to talk about the very first president to serve during this era, and that's James Monroe. Now, the era that James Monroe served in, or the country that he was taking over, um, was the United States that was in the middle of something called the Era of Good Feelings. And the Era of Good Feelings happened after we were able to fight the War of 1812 to a draw. Basically, we established ourselves as a force to be reckoned with internationally, and other countries kind of saw us as a legitimate power that shouldn't be messed with. All right, And it led to a lot of prosperity at home in the United States. Okay, both internationally and economically. We kind of regained our trade. Other countries now took us seriously. We didn't have too many threats to worry about. Uh, England and France were finally at peace in Europe, so we never had really the threat of going back to war. And that's the country that James Monroe takes over. Now, with the first four presidents, we talked a lot about what they did before their presidency to make them founding fathers. And James Monroe was really the last president who could be considered a founding father, all right, because his role in United States history does go back to the American Revolution. Now, not many people know much about James Monroe or they don't find him super interesting, um, but I kind of do, all right? If you've ever seen the movie Forrest Gump, Okay, um, I would equate James Monroe's role in the United States before he became president to the movie Forrest Gump. If you've never seen the movie, the basic synopsis is this, right? Forrest Gump is a guy who kind of unknowingly and without even realizing it, finds himself in the middle of all of these really, really important historical event, events of the 1960s um, and 1970s. All right? And James Monroe, in a lot of ways, was very similar. He just so happened to find himself right in the middle of a lot of really important historical events, both in the United States history and world history. So I present to you a little PowerPoint presentation I like to call James Monroe, the Forrest Gump of Presidents. Now, Monroe's role in United States history starts very early on with the Revolutionary War. So he drops out of school and he joins the Continental Army, and he just so happens to find himself fighting directly under George Washington's leadership. Okay, If you look over on the left... That's a very famous painting that we've seen in class of George Washington crossing the Delaware before the battle at Trenton. And that was that battle that we talked about uh, the morning after Christmas when he, he led a surprise attack on those British mercenaries um, and the German mercenaries known as Hessians. Um, basically thinking if he shows up very early on the morning after Christmas, um, they're going to be very startled and still hung over from celebrating Christmas. Um, and he was able to secure a victory. And that victory eventually led a lot of the troops uh, to re-enlist in the Continental Army for another year and kind of kept us alive and kept us going in the Revolutionary War. All right. Um, and on the left, you do see George Washington sailing, but not a lot of people know this. The person behind him in that painting is James Monroe. On the right is another famous picture of George Washington securing a surrender from the British at Trenton. And in the background, there's somebody who's wounded, a uh, soldier, and that's actually James Monroe as well. Uh, he does get wounded in the Battle of Trenton. He actually has a musket ball that gets stuck inside of him. And he never got it out. So for the rest of his life, he always used to say in his political speeches and stuff like that, that he carried the revolution with him everywhere that he went. Now, after the revolution, he goes and becomes a state senator um, in the state of Virginia. And the second monumental historical event that he finds himself in the middle of is Virginia ratifying the Constitution. All right, Virginia was the most important state at the time, and they're signing off on the Constitution after Alexander Hamilton uh, wrote the Federalist Papers, um, was really the state that swayed other states um, to also decide to sign on to it. So the Constitution we still have today was ratified in Virginia 
1988, and James Monroe was there for that. The next position that he held was the ambassadorship to France. So he's the ambassador to France during George Washington's administration when all that crazy stuff with the French Revolution is going on. So the leader of the French Revolution, especially at the beginning, was a guy by the name of Maximilien Robespierre. And eventually Robespierre got increasingly violent and he started using the guillotine during this era known as the Reign of Terror um, on a bunch of people, including the king and queen of France themselves. Now, in the end of the French Revolution, Robespierre himself gets executed by the guillotine. And James Monroe is there for that. By the end of the revolution, Napoleon, as we know, crowns himself to be the new emperor of France. James Monroe is there for that monumental occasion as well, right? So he's there for kind of the most violent period of the French Revolution, and he's there for what most people would consider to be the end of the French Revolution, and that's when Napoleon takes power and claims himself to be the new emperor. Now, having all that experience in France led Thomas Jefferson to promote James Monroe to negotiate the Louisiana Purchase. So when we're um, looking to buy New Orleans at first, um, he sends over James Monroe and basically tells him, look, you kind of have unlimited negotiating power here to be able to get this deal done. So when Napoleon comes back with the offer for us to buy the entire Louisiana territory for only $5 million more, the person who actually negotiates or facilitates this land deal, which most people consider the greatest land deal in history, is James Monroe. He's the actual person with the paperwork and doing the negotiating um, with Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, James Madison promotes James Monroe to be his secretary of state. So he's in charge of our relationship with foreign countries. And he's in charge of this at the time when the British and the French are at war and they're starting to impress American sailors and attack our merchant ships. And when the United States declares war for the very first time in 1812 as secretary of state, James Monroe is there for that event as well. Flash forward a little bit. In 1912, when the cruise liner, the Titanic, all right, the unsinkable ship, hits an iceberg. Some of you may have seen the movie, all right? James Monroe was there for that. Leonardo DiCaprio's character in the movie Titanic is very loosely based on James Monroe. In 1964, the Beatles make their very first appearance on the Ed Sullivan Show. Ask your grandparents, all right? The four members you see pictured, John Lennon, Ringo Starr, Paul McCartney, and James Monroe. He played all the instruments and did vocals too. When the United States lands its first man on the moon in 1969, all right? Right next to Buzz Aldrin, who but James Monroe. And that's why I consider James Monroe to be the Forrest Gump of presidents. Questions? There probably should be. But in all seriousness, let's talk a little bit about James Monroe's presidency. I want you to write these notes down. With the Missouri Compromise, right, Missouri wants to become a state. And you'll notice right here that Missouri wants to become a slave state. So they want to have slaves. Now, at the time, there were 11 slave states and 11 free states. So in the Senate, for example, where each state has two representatives, right, two senators, any issue that deals with slavery, if it was too extreme, would end up in a tie vote, all right? Now, they wanted to ensure that slavery wasn't going to be an issue that would divide the entire country. So they decided to come up with a compromise. And they basically say this, Missouri is going to come in as a slave state. 
We're also going to incorporate Maine. So if you look up to the right corner, Maine also becomes a state in 1820. All right. And they basically say that every time from there on out that a new state gets added to the union, right, they're going to try and balance it out with an opposite state. So if a new slave state comes into the union, they're going to try and also add a free state to maintain that balance between them. And they basically draw a line across the southern border of Missouri. And they say that territory beneath that is going to be available for slave states. Anywhere north of that cannot have slavery. And as you see at the time, all that gray area, we don't own yet. That's actually part of Mexico. But eventually, in a quest to expand our available territory for slave states, we're going to fight a war with Mexico about 20 years later. The next thing that you need to know when it comes to foreign policy is the Monroe Doctrine. So let's talk about that. So if you take a look at the two maps on the left, one of them is South America in 1790, right? So right after the American Revolution, right after we become an independent country, most of the areas there are owned by Spain. All right. With the exception of Brazil, that's owned by Portugal, like we talked about at the beginning of the year. That's the reason why every single country in Central and South America, they speak Spanish still to this day. That's their native language. All right. With the exception of a country like Brazil, and they speak Portuguese because they were a colony of Portugal. Now, if you look 38 years later, so by the end of the 1820s, all right, those countries most of them have become independent. So Venezuela, Colombia, Peru, right? Brazil, okay? Those countries have become independent, right? And that kind of shows what the American Revolution did for the world, okay? We fought this revolution. We no longer wanted to be a colony of another bigger, stronger country. We fought, we won, we became independent. Those countries in South America saw what we did and they did the same thing to their colonizing countries. They fought for independence and they gained it, all right, shortly after we did. So we really started a spark that would uh, extend to other places in the world, right? This idea of becoming an independent country. Now, here's why this is important to us, all right? These countries were brand new. All right. And at the time, like we mentioned earlier, the United States was starting to manufacture a lot of products. OK, we were starting to make things in factories. Problem is, we were making so much, we had a surplus or extra stuff. OK, and we needed people to sell our stuff too. these new countries in South America. Right. They're not manufacturing like we are. Right. They, the Industrial Revolution hasn't hit there yet at all. OK, so they don't have the products that we have. So we look at this as what's called the new market, right? New people for us to sell our stuff to and make money as a country. Now, because of this, right, we declare a statement, the Monroe Doctrine, it becomes known as. President Monroe basically says, look, all you newly independent countries of South America, we're going to protect you right, from your old colonizers, countries like Spain. OK. And they basically say, or Monroe basically says, you European countries, you're no longer allowed to colonize any country in South or Central America. You can't come back and try and reclaim them or else we're going to take it as a threat as the United States. All right. And this was really our first step into trying to solidify our place internationally. All right. This is our first step in terms of like declaring, hey, you're not only now going to leave us alone, but you're also going to leave these other countries alone because we say so. And it really was kind of a bold move. All right. But at the time, Europe was going through a phase where they were really peaceful. This was after all the wars of Napoleon had just ended. Right. Most countries in Europe didn't really have an appetite for any more kind of conflict. So they never really tried. Right. And the statement kind of worked. So we started trading more with these countries in South America and making a lot of money off of this. And other countries, for the most part, left their former colonies alone. 